I want to thank the uh, Heritage Life Committee of the Student Government Association for giving me the privilege of uh, providing today's welcome. Uh, so welcome. We're glad all of you are here. This is a day to celebrate our heritage as an institution, and this is the 185th academic year of Mercer University. It's a day to remember the contributions made by our original founders, those whose names you see memorialized across the campus, uh, Jesse Mercer, Adele Sherwood, Josiah Penfield, and many others. Founded by Baptists, Mercer University took root in a heritage born out of dissent in the free church tradition. At the center of our founding tradition is the ongoing demand for freedom, freedom of mind, freedom of conscience, freedom to express ideas. Our original founders envisioned a place that would be open to students regardless of their religious commitments. From the very beginning, as envisioned by our founders, diversity of thought and expression has also always been among our defining characteristics. We remember our original founders on this day each year, uh, but we also remember that every generation to pass through these halls helps shape the course of our university. Each of you here in this room will likewise leave your mark on this place. So in this sense, today celebrates the contributions of all of us. Mercer has a, a lot of great traditions and Founders Day is certainly one of, one, of the, one of my favorites. This year, probably more than most years, I took time to reflect on the meaning of Founders Day. A lot of people have shared with me over the year what they believe Founders Day is or at least what they believe it should be. Their input has varied widely, so out of curiosity, I asked some first year students who had never attended the event what they thought or at least heard the event was about. As you can imagine, most of them were perplexed. One ventured if it had something to do with Jesse Mercer's birthday, which is not a bad guess, as you'll soon find out. Another paused, looked quizzically at me, and finally he just gave up and said, free t-shirts. <laughs> but the one I liked best was a female student who responded with youthful honesty. She said, I have no idea. I guess I'll find out when I get there. Well, I may not have the perfect answer, but let me give it a crack. Students, first note is titled Founders Day. Founders is plural, not singular. This is a nod to the number of people that have helped create and or guide Mercer University. Mercer is not about one person or based on one understanding of our institution. We would not be here without a long list of people, including everyone in this room, who has or will have left their mark on this institution. Every one of us is unique, and every one of us has a story to tell. Mercer University values each and every one of us. According to the archives, the first actual Founders Day event was, in fact, hosted on Jesse Mercer's birthday. But it was structured to do so by fostering intellectual debate and discussion. The archives support that the first Founders Day didn't have just one, but they had two speakers. The event each had, they were both representing the two literary societies. So clearly, the original event was designed to recognize diversity of thought and to promote discussion. Apparently, however, these early Founder Day events were a bit stoic. And a decision was made to liven things up. So in 1894, Wesleyan College students were invited to the event. <laughs> it must have worked because a newspaper from back then notes this line, the, boy, <laughs> the boys declare that never before have they seen so many pretty young ladies in the crowd. From that time on, Founders Day took many forms, including one period of time in which academic speakers were scheduled for an entire day. Speakers have... <laughs> Speakers have included prominent alumni, college presidents, U.S. District Court judges, and even the governors of both Alabama and Georgia who spoke here together in 1944. But as you are probably aware, in the 1960s, college students across the country started exploring more unconventional ways to expand their minds. I'm not suggesting that happened at Mercer, but it was during this period of time, probably combined with general student unrest, that Founders Day got pushed to the wayside and disappeared for almost 30 years. However, in the 1990s, as students expressed a renewed interest in Mercer history and traditions, the event was brought back in its current form by SGA as a way of hearing from notable alumni about their experiences as an undergraduate student. 
It is here that I will end my remarks and let you reflect for yourselves on the meaning of Founders Day. Perhaps, like its beginning, Founders Day is about fostering intellectual debate and discussion. Perhaps, as it was re-envisioned, it's about hearing from noted alumni about their college experiences. Perhaps it's a combination of the two with some free t-shirts thrown in. I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I do know this. Creating meaning is a uniquely individual endeavor. As such, sometimes it's okay in life to set aside preconceived ideas and just experience something firsthand before assigning a value or a meaning. In fact, that may be the best way that we can learn and grow as a community. If so, maybe, just maybe that first year student said it best when she responded, I don't know, I guess I'll find out when I get there. My name is Ashila Jawani. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Heritage Life Committee Chair for the Student Government Association here at Mercer. In short, what that means is I get to plan all the exciting events like pilgrimage to Penfield, Christmas tree lighting, and right now, Founders Day that uphold Mercer's long-standing traditions which honor its rich heritage. It is also my honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Seculo, a native of New York, moved to Atlanta, Georgia in his late teens and attended Lakeside High School. In his early life, the idea of attending a four-year college was not so appealing to him until he looked into Atlanta Baptist College, which later merged with Mercer University in 1972. His life plan went something like this. Attend a local junior college, go back to work, but somewhere in that process, he grew a passion for learning, which yay for that. So story has it that the conversation between Dr. Seculo and his dad went something like this. Dad, he asked, will it bother you if I go to a school that calls itself a Baptist college? But, he says, his dad is a pragmatic man. Baptist, schmaptist, he told him. I'm glad you decided to go to a four-year college. Go ahead, get yourself that good education. Well, gosh, let's think about the fact if Dr. Seculo's dad hadn't said that, he would have missed out on the best school in the land. After graduating cum laude from Mercer University, Dr. Seculo then went on to Mercer Law School and graduated in the top 5% of his class. He met his wife at Mercer, and his nieces and nephews also attended Mercer University, which his nephew and his wife, who are both double bears, are also here today. So welcome to the both of you. Welcome to Mrs. Seculo. Besides being a successful lawyer, Dr. Seculo was also the front man for the Jay Seculo Band. Talk about that well-rounded liberal arts education, am I right? On that note, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker for Founders Day 2018, the double bear, an ex-SGA president, Dr. Jay Seculo. That was the first time I've been introduced as a classic rock drummer, but it's true. Um, thank you for having me. Thank the SGA for inviting me. I know firsthand how important these events are and, and how uh, much work you all put into doing this. And I thank you. I really appreciate it. And it's great to be back at Mercer. And uh, it was my nephew's grandfather, my father, that I told I was going to go to then Atlanta Baptist College, which as, before I got there became Mercer. As I was coming in, uh, became Mercer. And I actually met uh, my wife Pam 
before I was officially accepted as a student. Pam worked in the admissions office, which is also a bit of our family history as my niece uh, worked in the admissions office here. Pam worked at the admissions office at the Atlanta campus and gave me the tour of the facilities, which at, at that point the Atlanta campus was, I think, three buildings. And um, I would tell you something, though. I, I cherish that campus. I cherish my relationship with Mercer. I, as was mentioned, I, I came to New York, from New York to Atlanta. I was 16 years old. So I moved from Long Island. I was born in Brooklyn, to Atlanta, Georgia, in 1971. Could you imagine what that was like? First of all, I thought my high school teachers were speaking a different language. I literally had no clue. I had an uh, earth science professor, Linda Lamb, I still remember this, and she said something, but I had no idea what she said. And um, so I decided getting out of high school quickly was probably a good idea, and uh, we were a, a middle-class family. Uh, my father worked in retail, so I needed to work and go to college. And there was Atlanta Baptist, now becoming Mercer University, literally down the street. And he did say, Baptist, Baptist, go get a good education. Um, and I did. And I did. And um, one of the first courses I had at Mercer was Speech 101. The professor was Linda Langenbrook, Dr. Langenbrook. We sat, Mercer had only about two or three buildings, but they had this beautiful fine arts auditorium. It was in the round. And what you had to do in this particular class was give a speech, basically just go and give it. So I volunteered. And I went up and I gave this speech. And she said to me, I'll never forget it. She said, have you ever thought about doing that for a living? And I said, well, how do you, how do you speak for a living? Well, lawyers, we speak for a living. And um, that one moment, so many years ago, I remember like it was yesterday. I had a, another professor taught English, Dr. Smith. He had retired from Emory, and in his retirement decided he still wanted to teach. He came to Mercer, and he knew I wanted to go to law school. And he pulled me in his office one day, just said, I want you to come by and see me. And he looked at me, I don't know, who's in the English faculty here? Do we have any humanities? Yep, great. He looked at me and he said, nevertheless. I said, nevertheless. He said, nevertheless. One word, nevertheless. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to use nevertheless. <laughs> and boy, have I used nevertheless. <laughs> I'm using a lot of nevertheless right now. But... Um, I also have to digress on one other moment. I, I was not a great science student in high school, and I did not think I was a very good science student. So you had to take you know, the biology basic courses in science. And I had this professor named Dan May, Professor May. And I took biology, and Pam said, don't say this, but I'm going to say it. And you, you, had to, you were allowed to take a course pass-fail. So even as a freshman, I'm worried about getting into law school, right? So I said, science, use the pass-fails for biology. Professor May was so engaging that I fell in love with science. Unfortunately, I took it past fail. So I got a P instead of what would have been an A. I could have been a medical doctor instead of a lawyer. But who knew? But I think back on that, and this is, folks, I'm talking about 1974. And I'm still remembering those professors as if it was yesterday. I did really well in college. I did not do so well on the LSAT, the Law School Aptitude Test. So I had a difficulty with the LSAT, but I had a dean of my undergraduate school at Mercer who was the sister of Joe Hendricks. Her name was Jean Hendricks, and she was the dean of our college. And she said, I am going to call the dean of the Mercer Law School. And this, remember, this was before the internet, and you, now you can apply to, you know, 50 law schools, 150 law schools at the same time. In my days, you know, you knew, you knew there was Georgia, Emory, Mercer, and the, everybody said the fallback school, if you were gonna go out of state, was somewhere in northern Ohio. That was, but nobody knew anything about this, but she called John Cole. John Cole was the interim dean at the Walter F. George School of Law at Mercer University. He called me up and had me come down for an interview, and he said, I think it was his roommate in law school, 
had the same situation. Very good academically, not so great LSAT, ended up doing very well in law school, and he was going to admit me as um, a student at Mercer. About 15 years ago, I was, you wait, when you got a case of the Supreme Court, you wait for the, in the old days, before the internet was as prevalent. This is probably, this is probably more than a 14 years, it was probably in the 1990s, 95, 96. I was with a young associate, and they said, well, and we're waiting for the call. And the call was, Mr. Seculo, the writ of certiorari, the petition for certiorari has been granted. They didn't call you if it was not granted, but they called you if it was granted. And this young associate of mine said, well, what's it like getting a call from the clerk of the court? He was waiting with me to, to get this course. He's now has argued two cases at the Supreme Court of the United States. I said, well, it's significant, but it wasn't significant, as significant as the call I got from John Cole in September of 1977 and admitting me to law school. And that's the truth. This university changed my life and changed my family's life. In one sense, you created my family. And um, I had the privilege of returning back to campus just in the end of November for John Cole's last class. Um, and I told one of my classmates that it was exactly the same. He taught to the last moment of the last second, and he asked me a question. And um, I learned a lot of things while at law school about how to be a lawyer. And one of the things that I, I learned is that I am my lawyer's, I, as a lawyer, I play the role as advocate. That is the job I have. I am the lawyer. I'm not the conscience of the client. I am the lawyer for the client. And I think in today's world, sometimes we forget how important that is. That uh, whether you agree with the position of a particular individual, no naming, not naming the, who the individuals might be, or a particular client, and I'm going to go through a list of clients, and I'm going to go through a list of clients, and there will be students here today who will say, I agree with this one, and I don't agree with that one. But that wasn't my job. My job was to be the lawyer. So when I represented the, this will come as a surprise, American Civil Liberties Union, at both the trial court and at the Supreme Court of the United States, there may be some people that would be conservative that would not have liked me to have done that, but they were right. I represented Jews for Jesus at the Supreme Court of the United States and, and had a personal affinity for that organization and that ministry, but I also represented the Hare Krishnas. I did campaign finance reform litigation representing students so students would have the right to engage in free speech so that students don't shed their constitutional right to freedom of speech at the, at the, they used to say in the high school cases at the schoolhouse gate, but it equally applied to the university gate. I argued those cases. I had the privilege of, of arguing cases, including the National Democratic Policy Committee. Not because I necessarily agreed with any one of the client's particular views, but that the principle at stake was so significant that was drilled into me at Mercer University was that the judicial system matters. And lawyers, and we have, President Underwood, a rich heritage of lawyers in, in this university. I mean, you think about it. Senators, governors, attorney generals, multiple counsels to the president. It's a rich heritage, and it's not one I take lightly. But we were, you know, we were poor, poor law students. My wife came down here, she was a teacher. She taught in DeKalb County in Atlanta. But she came down here to teach while I was a, we got married after my first year of law school. We lived in an apartment complex off the Brown campus called Bear Arms. You don't remember Bear Arms. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> the joke was you needed a Bear Arms to live there. <laughs> um, but the, tr the truth of the matter is, I actually, I have lifelong friends from Bear Arms. In fact, the student that said, Posted on Facebook that I, when I attended John Cole's last class, Vicki Vilches, she was in the one building up from ours. It was a little safer part of the building where Vicki was. But Pam, and we got married, we moved down, and Pam is trying to find a job as a teacher. She gets hired in uh, Jones County. She taught at Maggie Califf Middle School, which was a school put together during the Work Progress Administration in the 1940s, WPA. It was a WPA school. So we lived on Gray Highway. It was halfway between the law school 
and Maggie Califf Elementary School. She had a debate, she had, and she, Pam took controversial issues. Patty Hearst was in the news then. You probably don't even remember, oh, there, oh, there's a CNN special, maybe you do know Patty Hearst. This was a big deal. The issue of euthanasia was starting to become a, a big deal. This, and this was a long time ago, it was, you know, 1977, so, uh, 78, so she had a debate in her, her seventh grade students, and I was one of the judges, and Stephen Berry, who is a graduate of Mercer University Law School and a first uh, New York Times, multiple New York Times best-selling author, he loved books then, he did. Steve was there, and a friend of mine, Ken Barr, is a very successful lawyer in Washington, and one of my current law partners even today, uh, Stuart Roth, was a classmate of mine at uh, Mercer Law School, was there, and we were the judges. And one of the students that was in that class is now your professor. She was a student at Maggie Califf Middle School. Professor Crutchfield is what she goes by now. And she is right here on the front row right there. And uh, she was a student of my wife, Pam, in Gray County. So we have our life with this university is very significant. I uh, did have the privilege of serving as a student government president, and for that, not only do I thank you, but I know what it's like. I even know what it's like going through having me as your speaker. Because in my days, it wasn't controversial speakers. It was getting a rock band to perform on campus. <laughs> but that would, believe me, just as controversial in, 19, in that particular time in 1973 or four, whenever we were doing that. But I learned a lot. I, I went through the list of cases, you know, I've defended acts of civil disobedience before the Supreme Court of the United States. I've defended First Amendment activities. I represented students that were not allowed to participate in, uh, in, in student clubs, including Bible clubs. I have argued for students to be able to participate in political activity, political campaigns. I have the only unanimous decision involving the Supreme Court of the United States and the Ten Commandments. Now think about that for a moment. Those cases are always controversial, not this one. But I also have the unique distinction, you know, as was I really appreciate you finding out about the drumming, so I'm a music guy. I have the only Supreme Court opinion in the United States history of the Supreme Court of the United States. I have the only opinion with an entire footnote that quotes the entire lyrics from the John Lennon song, Imagine. <laughs> and, the tr and the truth was, what happened was, in that case, so we're doing, <laughs> the case was, a uh, Ten Commandment monument was donated to a small town in Utah back when they were all being donated, which was primarily, people think it was the Fraternal Order of Eagles, and they have these monuments in, in small towns. It was actually, it was given to the Fraternal Order of Eagles, but it was actually to promote a movie called, you guessed it, The Ten Commandments. So this will be the mill. Charlton Heston came out for some of the dedications. So I had this case meander its way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, but it was a it was a government speech case. This was on a, a, a very much a government museum-like setting, a park with pioneer, pioneer heritage. And I wanted to use the argument that when a government accepts a monument in that kind of setting, you don't have to take a counter argument, a counter monument. And I'm a big free speech person. I, I believe in robust free speech. If you look at the clients I've represented, I had robust free speech, including current clients that have robust free speech. But let me say this. That particular case, that particular case, I used the example in the brief of, I went, to, I went to Central Park in New York because at Mercer University Law School, what was drilled into me was not only know your client and know the facts, see the facts. So I went to these parks to kind of get an idea of how other parks, I went to the Pioneer Park in Utah, but I went to Central Park with all those monuments. And there's this beautiful dedication uh, called Imagine in Strawberry Fields. It's right near the Dakota, which is where John Lennon was assassinated. And um, they had this beautiful monument, mosaic, with the words to imagine written on it, put in the mosaic. And I used that in a Supreme Court brief. And I was going to actually use it in the oral argument. I would be the first lawyer that brings a Beatle reference into the oral argument. We have a townhouse directly across, the, it's next to our office, directly across the street from the Supreme Court. I am walking out of, I go early really early in the morning to get ready. And um, in those days, I would drink a Diet Coke. That would be it. And as I'm walking out, my wife, Pam, a Mercer graduate, tells me, do not 
reference the Beatles in your oral argument. Half of them are octogenarians. They're not going to know what you're talking about. And the argument was going to be that New York would not have to take a monument dedicated to, for instance, Mark David Chapman, assassinated John Lennon. You wouldn't have to have a Statue of Liberty next to a Statue of Tyranny. So I used the Statue of Liberty, Statue of Tyranny. That was safe. I did not use the John Lennon, Mark David Chapman. But lo and behold, the opinion came out, and Justice Alito, writing for a unanimous court, quoted the entire version of Imagine. I wanted to send that to Yoko Ono. I never did, and I probably still should, because I don't think there's ever been a case since then. Justice Scalia would occasionally put references to opera, but there were not a lot of references. There are no references to the Beatles. Um, I try to be a consensus builder when I'm arguing cases. I tell you, I wasn't a great math and science student, but counting to five was something I could do, and if you couldn't get to five, guess what? You didn't win. But I had this one case which we had lost below, and Justice Rank was, he was giving me a hard time. And he would give me a hard time on occasion, but he was really giving me a hard time. And, um, and he asked me a particular, it's called overbreath doctrine, how it would apply to the case, and how do you want to win this case? Well, how I wanted to win the case was, and I ended up saying this, I, was, I lost below. So I said to the Chief Justice, I don't know, somewhere in the opinion, I'd like it to say reversed, which he laughed. I bring that out to a point. You don't always get, as famously the Rolling Stones say, you don't always get what you want. And you don't win every case at the Supreme Court. You don't, every win, you don't win every case in life. And I used to say, I'm the grandson of a Russian immigrant. I'm the second generation born in my family. And um, they start the Supreme Court the same way they've always started it. They call the case number 86-104. My colleague, my law partner, who's here right now, Andy Economo, and I did that case in 1986, and they started the same way. They say, oye, 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 the Supreme Court of the United States is now in session. They call the case number 86-104. Mr. Seculo will now hear from you. I, to this day, I still think about that. Mr. Seculo, the grandson of Shmulek Seculo, who came over on a boat from Russia in 1914, fleeing persecution with his family. His grands, my grandfather was a fruit peddler in Brooklyn, New York. One of the introductions, somebody once said he had a fruit stand in Brooklyn. It was not a fruit stand in Brooklyn. It was a cart in Brooklyn, New York. His grandson, me, I get to argue cases at the Supreme Court of the United States, and I got trained at Mercer to do it. So I understand. I understand the importance of every issue that we deal with in our country. And it used to be and I still think it is, and you, you all have been a very good example of that, an excellent example of that. You can agree to disagree without being disagreeable. I never called the lawyer on the other side the enemy. That lawyer was a officer of the court, as I am. And I appreciate the fact that as lawyers we've been given a special responsibility. It's not necessarily a popular responsibility, as you may have heard. Because sometimes cases you take are not popular. But it does not mean they're not important. What you're learning here, you're learning how to think. You're learning how to engage. Mercer has a tremendously rich heritage. But the heritage is the past. You are its future. You know, I used to say when they'd call at the Supreme Court, Mr. Seculo will now hear from you. That was the favorite thing being called. And then I had grandkids. So now I get called Papa, And that's a lot more fun than Mr. Seculo. But my grandkids are in your protection. Students of this university. You will be the leaders that will be protecting my grandchildren and generations to come. So you have a tremendously rich heritage here. You're not going to squander it, I know that. You'll expand on it. And each and every year since Mercer's founding, it has expanded, expanded. And you can expand that heritage in ways we never mentioned. We didn't think about a medical school when I was in Mercer undergraduate or schools of engineering. But here you have it. Cherish it. I, um, I want to close with this. I'm looking forward. I'm going to speak to students after we're going to do a forum in after lunch. But I want to 
say a couple things before, before I get to the forum this afternoon, because I'm sure not everybody's going to be able to attend the forum. But what I tell people is that if you believe in a robust First Amendment, freedom of speech, free exercise of religion, no establishment of religion, the ability to redress government for redress of grievances, these are the core of who we are. That, that makes us unique from any other country. No other country has the breadth and scope of freedoms outlined in its founding document as we do in the United States. That's just fact. Others have tried to copy it, but they can't quite get the same American experience. Because unless you're Native American, you are an immigrant. Your family heritage did not start in the United States of America unless you're Native American. So that melting pot of who we are makes a big difference. This university has had diversity since its founding. I will tell you something about the Atlanta campus. I think I shared this with you. Dr. Underwood, we were, it was a commuter campus mostly. Our biggest challenge at the SGA was getting students to come back on campus for events because it was a commuter, it was a commuter campus. But we had the kid from Brooklyn, the gal from Decatur, a lot of students from Andy's church, which is the Greek Orthodox church, classmates of ours. We had students that were religious that were not religious. A lot of Baptists, a lot of non-Baptists. Greek Orthodox, students that didn't have any particular faith. Mercer's always had that tradition. That's not something to run away from. That's something to embrace. I always think the way you handle speech that you disagree with is with more speech. And that's why I've been so aggressive in courts on free speech. Uninhibited and robust. My favorite justice, Thurgood Marshall. Very first case I had, I was a nervous wreck. And there was Thurgood Marshall, who'd been on my side of the podium and knew exactly what I was going through. And there he was, the legend. And he was a tough questioner. And I'd studied every case that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund ever brought, how they laid it out how they took one and laid it on another. They were incrementalists, which by the way, I, they got a lot of flack for being incrementalist in those days. Within the civil rights community, there was a real split on whether the approach he was taking was right. But there he was, the legend, one off from the center, Thurgood Marshall, towering giant in the law, and a towering giant as a man. I mean, he's a big guy. And we're arguing this case. I was representing Jews for Jesus. And I do my argument, and then the other side, James Capel was the lawyer's name, I still remember it. He gets up. Thurgood Marshall, they're asking questions back and forth on constitutional issues, this, and first, is it a public forum? Thurgood Marshall, who always got right to the chase, presses the little button on his microphone, had that big robe, leans in. Mr. Capel, what is it about these people you don't like? Which is a pretty good sign for me. That was. In 1986, a long time ago, and the truth is we don't not like people. People can disagree. What I learned here on this campus, you stand for your principles, think with an open mind, protect the heritage of the university, but move that heritage forward. I want to say thank you for inviting me, but I also want to say thank you, Mercer, because you impacted my life and my family's life. And to the students that are here, you are the leaders to come. It is your generation, as I said, that protect my grandchildren. I view that as a sacred trust. Thank you for having me.